Your Bible makes many bold claims and dares you to prove any of it false. Learn why you can stake your life on every word of the Holy Bible. Next, on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. Queen Elizabeth was coronated on the British throne in 1953. And during that ceremony, they uh, gave her a Bible and said that this is the most valuable thing in the world. Now, is that true? Well, I tell you, you can prove that it is. The most valuable thing in the world. Abraham Lincoln said, if we don't have the Bible and believe in the Bible, we don't even know what's right and what's wrong. Mr. Armstrong, Herbert Armstrong, said of himself and his wife that when he was called into the church, really studied the Bible and proved everything, that uh, they fell in love with the Bible. They fell in love with it. And he not only fell in love with the Bible, but he disproved the theory of evolution at the same time. He disproved it. Now, many people in this world would disagree with that today, but did you know that scientists have never found a fossil of part man and, and uh, part animal or whatever we were supposed to have come from? <laughs> have you ever seen a fossil like that? They never have, and they never will. So the Bible itself proves that evolution is a theory that's absolutely wrong. The origin of man goes back to Adam and Eve, just like the Bible says. And you can prove that to yourself. Why do many churches disagree with the Bible when it comes to the creation of Adam and Eve and man, the origin of man? Have you ever really tried to prove and worked hard to prove the authority of the Bible? I'm telling you, it is a, uh, the most amazing journey you'll ever have. If you look at educators today and university students, they'll be taught about the theory of evolution often. But do they ever teach about God and the Bible? Well, not really. So God says, prove me now herewith, and prove all things, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. Notice what it says. This is taken from The Proof of the Bible by Herbert Armstrong, and we'll send you that booklet today if you request it. But here's what it says. Most highly educated people and men of science assume that the Bible is not the infallible revelation of a supernatural God, and they assume this without the scientific proof that they demand on material questions. And he goes on to say, most fundamental believers assume on sheer faith, never having seen proof that the Holy Bible is the very Word of God. But why don't we prove the Bible is God's Word? God challenges us to do that time and time again in the Bible. Notice Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, it says, Man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Eternal does man live. Now, this is how man lives spiritually. And you can know every word of the Bible, God says. That's the Old and New Testament. And I'll prove that much of that as we go along here today. But uh, God is not asking us to do something that we can't do. We can understand every word of the Bible. And certainly it's a process, and it takes time to do that. But nevertheless, that's what God challenges you and me to do. Notice Matthew 4 and verse 4. Christ actually quoted Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3 in Matthew 4 and verse 4. But He answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Every word. What do you mean, every word? That's what Christ said. These are His own words. And He's quoting Deuteronomy of the Old Testament. So He's all in on the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
every word Christ says. And He's saying that this Bible is Jesus Christ in print. That's what He's saying. And He's tying the Old Testament to the New Testament. And that, too, is most interesting. Now, in Luke 16 and verse 17, it says this, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fall. That tittle is just a small thing, like a cross T or a dotted I. These, again, are Christ's own words. And He's talking about the law is failing. He's really talking about the entire Bible here, because the Bible is a book of law, and it is often phrased that very way. But what is this about? Heaven and earth will pass away before one little tittle of the Bible will be taken away, or not placed in the Bible where it belongs. That's really the kind of statement that is uh, very challenging, <laughs> to say the least. And now notice Matthew 5 and verse 18. Verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law or the Bible, till all be fulfilled. It certainly includes law. Notice what we wrote in our Correspondence Course 15, and I'll just give you a small quote here. Jot is the smallest Hebrew letter, and a tittle is a small mark placed over certain letters, like the crossing of the T and the dotting of the I, but something really small. And this is how, how much you can trust the Bible, totally trust it. The Jews had a very meticulous method of reproducing the ancient text to the extent that they counted letters, words, phrases, and verses, and even verified the middle letters, words, and verses of each book. They preserved every letter of God's Word, every letter. Not one was missing, said Jesus Christ. Not one letter was missing from the Bible. Is this a book just written by men? No, it isn't. It's a book inspired by the great God and authored by the great God through men, but nevertheless, God's doing, God's creation. And if not a single letter was missing, then certainly not a single book was missing. Well, how about that? That's quite a, quite a statement. Now I'll read to you another statement of Christ here in Luke 24 and verse 44. And He said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning Me." Now what does that mean? Well, again, our Correspondence Course 15 will explain that to you, and I'll just give a short quote here to you. It's talking about all of the inspired books of the Old Testament, all of them. Here's a comment. The Old Testament canon is divided into three sections. The Law of Moses, the Prophets, the Psalms, or Writings. These are the Scriptures spoken of and confirmed by Christ, the entirety of the Old Testament, as it has been preserved, unaltered, to this very day." Now, that's the whole of the Old Testament. And you can read John 5 and verse 39. Well, I can just quickly read this to you. Search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are that which testify of Me. And so it's through the Scriptures that you have eternal life. Is that important? Is this Bible really the most important thing in the world? And I tell you, it is. And that is the great tragedy in this world today. Men don't understand this. God gets the message out there, but they're usually hostile toward it. The carnal mind is enmity or hostile to God, Romans 8 and verse 7. That is something we need to keep in mind. Another quote from our Correspondence Course 15. Notice that Jesus pointed to the Scriptures, the only sacred writings that the Jews possessed, 
that foretold the coming of the Messiah were the books of the Old Testament. Here Jesus validates them as Scripture. He also cited the Old Testament as a true and reliable source of history. Did you know that the New Testament refers to the Old Testament about 250 times, specifically, precisely? Now, the Bible never contradicts itself. The Old Testament doesn't contradict the New Testament and vice versa. They complete each other. And as I recall, I think about one-fourth of the New Testament is quoting the Old Testament. So they tie each other together. You can't separate them. God promised, promised that the New Testament and the Old Testament would be preserved. He promised that to you. You can trust God, and you can prove that, that He does exactly what He says, precisely down to the last jot and tittle. He does that. Why won't men accept this wonderful truth that would increase their joy and their happiness and bring, take care of all the problems that we face today and build love between all of men for each other? Why do we reject that? because we don't understand God. We don't know God, and apparently are not interested in knowing Him in most cases. But as men see things falling apart more and more and more, they're going to see there's only one solution to all these problems. Only one. Notice verse 16, "...bind up the testimony, seal the law among the disciples." Talking about, really, the whole Bible again. And he said, Now you, you seal that according to the disciples. This is a prophecy that we need to understand. Well, what does it mean? What is this prophecy really saying? Okay, a quote from the Correspondence Course again, Lesson 15. Did the Old Testament prophesy that Christ's disciples would be the ones to close the canon of Scripture? Well, it says here the uh, Old Testament books were made in the form of rolls or scrolls and were often affixed with a seal when completed, as we seal a letter. The apostles were used to bind up or close up the testimony of Jesus Christ and complete the Bible." Now, you see, it's, this is all binding on true Christians, or spiritual Jews, as it says in Romans 3, verses 28 and 29. This is all about salvation. Is the Bible important to this world? Is it the most valuable thing in this world? We need to really think about this seriously. Notice what it says in Romans 3, verses 1 and 2. I'll just paraphrase it. It's about the oracles of God being given to the Jews. The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, according to the Companion Bible. God entrusted them to preserve the oracles of God are all of the Old Testament in the calendar and the, the holy days and the like, the beginning of the day and the ending of the day and so on. God entrusted the Jews with all of those oracles. And then here's what we wrote about Ezra, Nehemiah, and the body of priests and elders known in the great assembly. This great assembly consisted of 120 men of whom Ezra, a skilled scribe, Ezra 7, verse 6, was the chief. Ezra was a prophet. He was a man with the Holy Spirit. Very few of them had the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. So obviously, God is not going, they're not lost. They, don't have, they haven't ever really got, known God. But they will have that opportunity. Every man who's ever lived will. But he's letting you know that a man with the Holy Spirit watched over all of this and made sure in the Old Testament that everything was precisely the way that God inspired it. Now, that's something we cannot get wrong, or we're in trouble spiritually. Notice verse 15 of 2 Timothy 3. And that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, Paul talking to Timothy, 
which are able to make you wise unto salvation. It's about salvation. Is that important? Salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Notice this, verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Well, how about that? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and that word inspiration would be better translated, God breathed. It came right out of the mouth of God. All Scripture. Well, who believes that today? Can we push aside parts of Scripture and, and still believe God? No, we can't. But I'm telling you, every word is God breathed. Does that sound impossible? No, it isn't. Not with God. He even knows every time a sparrow falls over dead. God knows. God created us in our minds. He knows. It comes from the very mouth of God. Is that, a, is that the most important gift in the world? How could it not be? How could it not be that it's right here in this world for us if we want it, but most people don't, even though it's the most sold book in the world. It's understood by only a tiny few. This is really, in a way, uh, something you have to work hard at to comprehend it, but the Bible never, never contradicts itself. 2 Timothy 3 and, and verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect. You do that so you can be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect, yes, perfect in attitude. We can be perfect in attitude. And that is important if we're ever going to be in God's family. And you can read Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. You can read that yourself, but it says, My counsel shall stand, and His counsel is throughout the Bible. And He says, it's, It shall stand. And then verse 24 of Isaiah 41 says this in one translation, Now the Eternal cries, Bring your case forward. Now Jacob's king cries, State your proofs. Give me your proofs. Here God says, Now come on, let's give me your proofs. Here's what Moffat says about those verses 21 through 24. Let us hear what happened in the past, that we may ponder it, or show me what is yet to be, that you may watch how it turns out. Or yet, let us hear what is coming, or the prophecy fulfilled, that we may be sure you are God's. Come, do something or other, that we may marvel at the sight. Why? You are things of naught. You can do nothing at all. <laughs> God is just taunting the skeptics. They can't make prophecy being fulfilled, and every prophecy in the Bible will be fulfilled if it hasn't already. A promise from God, every one of them. Can man do that? Now, you just need, it doesn't take that much to prove it, and especially in this day today, in this end time, where 90% of that prophecy is being fulfilled right before our eyes. That's a wonderful truth. Can you foretell? Can I foretell? No, we can't. We're human. God can, though. He certainly can. But when you see those prophecies and you see them come to pass, this is God speaking, speaking to us in a powerful way, and that's a great proof of God there in itself. Not one prophecy has ever failed. You can prove that, and that is a startling statement, I'm sure, to a lot of people. But there's no other book like this in the world. God says, okay, I'm taunting the skeptic. Every single prophecy in this book is fulfilled, or it's going to be fulfilled, and not one of them, not one, will fail. What a marvelous statement from the great God. I tell you, we need to uh, re repeat those statements like that 
and you can that way you can prove the existence of God. And as I said before, one third of the Bible is prophecy. Nine tenths of it, I did say, is a prophecy for today. Nine tenths of it. When you think about all this, it really is something where God is challenging you, every one of you, me, everybody, that will be challenged. Until the 17th century, this is the Correspondence Course 15 again, and we'll send this to you and offer it to you at the end of this program. But until the 17th century, the advent of telescopes, scientists believed there were about 6,000 stars. 17th century, 6,000 stars. Today, they estimate there are about 70 sextillion, that's 70 followed by 21 zeros, that they can reckon. Jeremiah knew over 2,500 years ago that man could never count the number of stars. Well, how about that? Jeremiah knew about a lot more than all the scientists until after uh, the 17th century. Well, where do you suppose Jeremiah got that understanding? It's all right there in your Bible. And God tells us so many things like that that are right there in the Bible, and we have simply not known it or not wanted to know it. But think about what God is giving us. And I mean, you just keep finding more and more truths as you study this Bible. It is, after all, Christ in print. It is the mind of God. And it tells you how He thinks and what He thinks about. David said he just rejoiced at God's Word like he had found a great treasure. That's what he said. He, he found a valuable treasure, and he found that it would make him happy. It would make him courageous. It would make him joyful. It would make him really excited about life in every single way. And he just tried to give his whole heart to God, and did. He was a man after God's own heart. In every little jot and tittle, he was determined to keep it. That was David seeking after God's own heart. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. Request the Proof of the Bible and the Book of Books. Ask about enrollment in the Herbert W. Armstrong College Bible Correspondence Course. Order now. The preceding program was a paid presentation of The Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.